So module 23, corpora as primary resource for ENT. So long, we have talked about the features, nature, construction process, state present state of corpus and processing of corpus. The last inevitable section of this discussion is utilization or application of corpus in various domains of human knowledge. So keeping in mind in the rest of the modules of this course, we'll try to identify how we can utilize language corpora of Indian languages or that of English in various domains of our regular language related activities, starting from English language teaching, dictionary comparison, dialectology, and many other things. So, in the subsequent modules, we will try to concentrate on these things, athletes and potentials. And finally, we will try to understand as in detail where we stand uh, and what are the means, future directions, or future requirements for us. In this module, we are trying to see how corpora can be used as a primary resource for English language teaching. So the basic rationale is that here we are talking or taking the English language corpus as basic input and trying to trying to manipulate this corpus in different ways or hours to retrieve, to utilize it as a primary resource in teaching. So first we need to know why we need to depend, depend on um, corpus, English language day to day, day yeah. corpus of English language use for our purpose. What are the advantages we get than our traditional method of ENT? So we can sum up the whole things in this manner that intuition based ENT text materials are often found to be missing. And still, because most of the cases, those in ELT materials will be based on intuitions. Suddenly, uh, contain intuitively invented examples, which normally overlook or even ignore the important aspects of language usage and foreground less frequent stylistic choices at the expense of the more frequent. But what principles we are looking to that? We emphasize that the learners will learn English as their second language, particularly in Indian context. They should be more exposed to those words, terms, and patterns of sentences which are more frequent, more recurring, more commonly used for common people. So, uses based approach in here is more important to train our students in a far better way to bring, make them more great, more powerful, more elegant in English. Second, corpus based ELT materials are far more reliable and authentic because these are developed from corpora that contain data information and examples of real life language usage. Here, the common choices of linguistic usage are given more attention and preference than the real ones. So, corpus data, which is used now in ENT, are more authentic, more valuable, more reliable than it is used. And it is also proved or is seen that when learners are trained with corpus, they perform far better in their performance than those people who are intuitively trained. 
In fact, several studies made across the globe by English corpora was directly used in classroom teaching to the lads and other people who are not who are not trained with corpus and clearly noted, observed in empirical studies have clearly reported that those people who are trained with reference to corpus, they perform far better than those people who are trained without corpus. So there are many such advantages. Therefore, it is always better that we should go uh, to corpus to train our lives. So first here, we can have a look at that uh, in English language corpus, we have to speak two parts. One is speech, speech part, another is text part. Now, let us see how we can use those two components, two parts, in cases of teaching Indian lives. So, here is a tree diagram which has been given here, and that can give you a very clear idea how the speech part of the English corpus and the text part of the English corpus can be used to train in their lives while the ELT courses are introduced to them. So first let me take the speech part, say verbal communication. As you will know that the verbal communication is a unique kind of event where a lot of things are involved. So, if we, if we look at any two examples of verbal communication between two native English speakers and two non-native English speakers, you can clearly understand that they, the native speakers actually do it more fluently, more elegantly, more better way than the non-native speakers. So, if you want to train them, the non-native speakers, about the clarity of the verbal communication, the fluency of the verbal communication, the smoothness in her communication that definitely we can directly collect some examples some texts from the speech corpus and present them to them and also can be used to train them second important part speech and accent use even if we teach us in a most rigorous way in classroom the teacher won't be able to give the exact ways instructions uh, how to use speech and accents while you are speaking in a normal way as the native people do. So corpus has the potential, corpus has the chance to cite the examples and examples, actual uh, examples of interactions where speeches, speech and accents are properly used. And the learners, if the learners can follow those, imitate those or can identify where particular kind of pitch accent is given, what kind of stress accent is given, and what kind of head value various textbooks. Same thing in happiness in cases of interactions. As you know, the interesting pattern is very important to communicate properly, properly, rightly, and adequately. So, speech corpus has a quality to treat, to train Indian learners about the interesting patterns of the standard text pronunciation or communications. Verbal then the question of suprasyntum segmental comes in. So as you know that it is very difficult for us to learn the suprasegmental properties and use them appropriately, adequately, rightly inside the speech, even such from the text, until and unless we are adequately trained into it. So the English speech corpus can be highly useful for this purpose where we can have a lot of examples, uh, citations, references to the corpus to find out how in different contexts the normal regular native native speakers use the super sequences properly in speech. So there are various other types say mediation is another kind of text we need in our training. Negotiation how they do in normal speech, how they do negotiate things, how they do the task-based speech that's carried out, examples of task-based speech can be taken to train learners. Then in speech, the very important part is term taking on the basis. How the term people communicate, how one person finishes and the second person starts, or the interlocutors exchange ideas, views, or communicate, and following the process which is called term taking on the basis. 
So that is a very crucial thing to learn when you come in here. So Indian learners can have full text reference from the ELC to be used in classroom also to give some guidance to uh, uh, training how to do that. Same thing also happens in cases of dialectic interactions, emphatic communications, modulations of text based on context, the dynamic property of speech to be captured in training, the spontaneity of speech, then how the use of everyday lex lexies, then non-standard grammar, use of non-standard grammar, various stylistic variations, interactive discourses, language in action, what are the structure, change, modulations when the language in action, formalities and informalities, management of public space in communication, use of silence and a very important thing how you are going to use silence in communication. So in, in case of speech data analysis, speech part, you can get so many nearly uh, 20 important properties which we need to teach to the Indian learners, but these are not really there with you. So, what you can do is that we can refer to the English speech text, speech corpus, to get those data information to be trained to the Indian learners. Now, if you go back to the text part, you can find out that there are various ways where we can get information from the text corpus. If we say the list we have given here, if you refer to the list, you can do that. In the speech corpus, the text corpus can give you some ground information about the patterns of written communication, the use of standard grammar writing, the grammatical complexities in formation of sentences, the lexical choice variations in constructions of a text, the patterns of lexical usages, the nature of lexical collocation, the patterns of narrativity, drafting and rewriting the text, formal writing and informal writing, monologic organizations, combinations of text, the script of a synoptic structure of the text, use of prestige lexies inside the text if it is a very highly formal one, and a lot of stylistic variations, the argument structuring, use of the mediums, phrases, proverbs, multi-word units, figurative expressions, logical text compositions, information packaging. So all those things also come into the written text. So all those properties which we need to teach to the learners are not easily available to us except we refer to the English text corpus. So what we argue here is that we can refer to the English language corpus for the purpose of English language teaching. Then the next point is data driven learning. So, data driven learning, the basic argument is that all the learning process, all the teaching language teaching process should be based on data. Here, if you want to teach the pronunciation variations of the sounds to the in the learners, we need to refer to the data which is available here in the English speech course. Suppose what we have come across various times that suppose in English, English A, how to pronounce it? So the textbooks that are available to us don't, don't give us accurate descriptions or accurate information how it has been. Maybe one or all the time if you look at the text materials you can find out that English A is always pronounced as A in almost all the ELT text materials available in India mm. for the Indian learners. But analysis of uh, English corpus shows that this particular letter has at least eight different pronunciation variants based on contexts based on the data. So now the question is, if we have a speech corpus ready with us, even if the speech corpus where all the variations of pronunciation of this particular letter is available, we can give them to the learners and train them how depending on the various context and usage this model, how these learners should learn to pronounce this word or this letter in different contexts, in different ways. So what happens that if you provide the, the, the corpus itself to the learners, this is another important part that rather than a teacher instructing the learners all the time that this is the way we have to search, this is the way we have to learn, this is the way we have to carry out the tasks, or this is the way you have to imitate the pronunciations, 
or uses have the words or something like that is the way you have to construct the sentence. Rather than doing all those kinds of instruct, instruct, instructive activities, think we are giving the entire corpus to the learners and asking them, you explore the, the, the corpus and find out what are the meanings of the text. Suppose I have given you a simple text with say 30 sentences, technically the corpus, and ask the learners, can you find out how the word the is used in different sentences in different frames and can you generalize them? Can you find out any patterns? So what happens here, the learners are no more instructed by the teacher. Rather, they are trained, they are investigation motivation is trained. So they are now no more uh, are learners, rather they are explorers. So they become they become more interested in that trend because we have put a challenge before them. So learners what the two now they are searching to the texts between the words and try to identify why the particular word the uh, uh, the article D is occurring. And they also try to gather all the examples, all the sentences or combinations where the article has taken place. Now if you ask them, can you identify if there is any variations in use or any patterns of use? Uh, and if you can give some clues, then we find out why D is used, why D is not used, why A is used. Then that kind of comparative studies can give them far better understanding of the language. And they themselves can learn more important things, many new things which the teacher may not have perceived, may not have realized them. So suppose you give a full present text to the learners, where there are a lot of uses of D, a lot of uses of A, a lot of uses of M. And we can ask them, can you identify the situations where these three types of articles are used? Then you can classify and identify what are the reasons behind that. In that case, it is possible that the learners can themselves identify the situations, how those three articles are distributed, and also they can find out the reasons behind that. So this makes the learners much more empowered much more important to understand the patterns of use. So this is basically called a data learning. The second or third point, yearly learning sizes. So what happened that uh, now we are setting the questions to the learners using the corpus corpus data and giving the data and asking them to carry out the tasks which are assigned to them. We can little go a little farther, particularly in cases of advanced plans rather than the primary gardeners or when it was beginners. In case of adverb gardeners, we can go little more there. We give up the cards of different types, text types, and ask the learners to formulate questions of their own and to address these questions from the corpus itself. So what the two can they can do is that they can study the corpus, identify certain features, and formulate questions. Then they further explore and justify the process. Our basic target here is that in the advanced courses, they develop a scientific uh, orientation to study languages in a more intimate manner, identify the finer aspects of the languages, memorize them, assimilate them, and practice it. So here, advanced learners can have better scope to grow themselves and far better learner languages if they are supported yet. So what we say that uh, that English corpus of Indian of Africa can have multiple applications directly. In all these cases here we are thinking of English corpus as a primary resource actually used for the learners. Now the, if you look at the error characteristics, this is an important part in uh, language teaching. So as you know that Indian learners make uh, a lot of errors in use of appropriate proverb, uh, prepositions, even in articles, even DVDs. And we also make some things, we, we personally we can tell that we are often confused where D has to be used and D not has to be used. So, well, if we can teach them uh, repeatedly several times saying the same thing, 
Ibarat minat haji that can be success as you expect. On the other hand, what if you do? You can ask them, can you please produce a text of your own produced by them? It is a text producing love. Now put that text side by side with the English text and ask them to identify what kind of errors they made. And that can be corrected in reference based relevant public scholars. But we are going to look at that. The errors which are made by the public are of great importance to rectify those errors and provide appropriate remedies to that. So what we can do is that we can uh, identify by analyzing the text produced by the Brahmins, the errors they have made. And also we can classify what kind of errors they are actually making. Grammatical errors, syntactic errors, semantic errors, or errors in lexical use, or whatever. Once these are identified properly, categories are classified. We can literally go back to the English language corpus, which is now kept in concert with the New Zealand benchmark, and instruct the Lamas to follow and to identify, uh, to make corrections of the errors. So we have yet a tremendous role to play in error corrections of the errors. So in the Indian culture classroom teachings also, we can use those uh, a, a English language corpus. I think one of the important primary resources to make changes or to make corrections of the errors made by the class. The another important part of ELC, that is the corpus, in ELT is sense awareness aspects. So it is almost almost approved that the words which are available in CD and the meanings which are produced in the DCD against each other is not the same when the word is used in a text and the range of senses it gives. Quite several experiments have been made and we have clearly understood that the word when it is used in a piece of text can keep many, many new range of new range of senses which may not be available in a standard dictionary. However, you can reach, however, very If this is so, then it becomes a very difficult task for the learners to understand in which senses the word is used. Here lies the importance of concordance or keyword in contexts or other tools for the learners for teaching them the sense various aspects. But we argue that words has many senses. And a word can be used in a corpus in many different senses. If this is so, then we need to produce a corpus with all possible senses available and present in different contexts in a very systematic way, in a concordance pattern, so that we can. The learners can examine those sentences and identify in different how the word is used in many different senses and how that particular sense can be retrieved, can be understood, can be captured with reference to the context. Here I can give, give an example or say some sentences uh, from the BNC where you can find out that words are used in a very different senses. Just a minute, I can give it. So, here, look at these examples here. So, it says, I'm giving the example of great. An individual is capable of both great compassion and great independence. Now, look at the sense of the great here in great compassion and great independence. But friendship is a great thing. Definitely, we understand that the meaning of great in great compassion or great independence. And the meaning of great is a great thing is to be. Look at the next example. He lived to a great age of his life. Now, if you look at the third example, the great is not giving the same sense as we noted in earlier two examples. Now, if you look at the fourth example, his great uncle was a pilot for British Airways. 
heart, if you have love in your life, it get many things to love, lack. Or, love and magic have a great deal in common. Many men worry over the great number of reasons. Rainy season is not a great one for travel. Sex is a great thing, provided you know the tricks. The temptation is a great treason to do the right deed for the wrong reason. So if you look at the examples given here, great has many different senses. And I'm sure a dictionary have a large level, have a very level. If it is not for this text, may not be able to give all the senses at in the text. So here we can produce a conference list of the keywords and present them to the learners so that they themselves can go through the text and identify what are the senses it takes, what are the <coughs> meaning variation of the word takes. So Corpus is highly useful in understanding sense variations and meaning variations of words that are used in texts. Similarly, Corpus has tremendous role to play in understanding the stylistic variations of texts. Particularly in ELT, we always try to teach the normal, uh, standard, acceptable kind of thing uh, which is accepted as a normal standard word in English. But we know very clear that English texts stylistically differ based on the domain or subject. The way a legal text is produced, made, is not the same way the text is going to be produced in cases of similar literature. Or if you look at the texts of a sports narrative or sports event, a report is completely different than a scientific text. So what is our here is that even in text written text cases, there are a lot of stylistic variations, not only based on genres, based on terms, subject matter, text types, or even in individuals. But we never give much importance to them, to these variations, while we are teaching Indian learners about ELT or ELT courses. So this is very important for us to know that we now can provide them those facilities. Now we can present six or seven or ten different stylistic texts of different stylistic constructions or stylistic uh, patterns or stylistic usages to the learners and ask them to compare among them. Find out how a particular text is different from the other. The stylistic uniqueness of the particular text belongs to a particular domain, particular category. So they will be more uh, explorative in nature, they will more explore, uh, understand how the stylistic thing, one text can arise from other because of certain properties, certain features, certain constructions and all other things. So what I argue here is that English texts of different types can be assembled together. together. Now and can be presented to the learners so that they learn more intimately the stylistic variations of Jerky, different kinds of various texts. And if possible, they can train themselves or assimilate those properties so that they in their life also can have that kind of skill to produce texts of different types and different stylistic variations. So these are the some of the major applications of English language corpus in direct primary resources in classroom teaching in, in ELT courses, uh, ELT English language teaching courses to the non native learners. So, what I argue here as a conclusion that if you want to change the strategy, the process of teaching to the Indian learners and to make them more powerful in English in communications, then definitely you need to take help of English language corpora and use them as a primary resource in English language teaching. In the next module, I'll be talking about how this corpus can be used as a secondary resource for developing various uh, materials for English language teaching to the Indian learners. Thank you.